which is a record of the Green Lottery. Um, the, we have three quite diverse speakers here tonight, and uh, each one will speak for 20 minutes. And then at the end of that, we'll have 30 minutes of a question and answer for all three uh, speakers, and then we can adjourn for some drinks and wine and nipples and things. And, uh, that'll be out there. Sorry about the chairs. Uh, the crowd here should have left at 6 o'clock, and they're still here, uh, and we wanted our chairs. <laughs> so, um, anyways, and we've got more arriving. <laughs> Hiya. Sorry about the chairs. Uh, there's a noble run in a meeting here, and uh, as soon as they go, and I think they're beginning to loosen up a bit, uh, we'll have chairs for all of you. So, anyway, yes, the three, three will speak, one after another, uh, and um, there will, the, will be plenty of time for question and answer after, and, uh, or even you can meet the uh, speakers at over a glass of wine, which is quite pleasant. And, um, uh, that's fine if the third speaker comes, because we're missing one at the moment, who is on our way home from America, especially to come here. So anyway, Ben, where are you going to? Ben is the first. He's here. He's the first one. I'll let him introduce himself, and uh, yeah, all over to you. Sure. Uh, we will pass the bucket around at some stage. Uh, Unfortunately, we do require money. Uh, I mean, you don't have to, but uh, yes. And I would also like, if possible, to have a, uh, a silent collection so that the uh, jingle of money doesn't upset the speakers. My name's Ben Griffin. I'm a former soldier, and I'm the coordinator of an organisation called Veterans for Peace. We're former servicemen and women uh, who have come to the conclusion that war... Um, causes a lot more problems than it solves. Um, part of our work is to educate the public on the true nature of warfare. I've been invited here tonight to give you an insight into mod modern military operations, and I'm going to do that through, um, through retelling my own experience and adding some, some other bits and pieces in there. Uh, I'll keep this into the 20 minutes, and uh, like Noel said, there'll be questions at the end. This is usually quite a much longer sort of lecture, so I'm, if you've got any questions after, uh, you can always just come and grab me in the bar. Um, has anyone been in the military in the room? Just the one at the back there. <laughs> Sorry, don't need to duck. <coughs> Join us later. Um, so I suppose what I talk about quickly at the start is why someone would join the military. You know, um, might be a, sort of seem like a strange thing for someone to do. You know, if, if you if you've got no one in the family or if you haven't been in the military yourself. Um, and for me, there are, there are two main reasons why a person would join the military. Those can be split into two groups of reasons, uh, ideological and economic. If you're in the British Army, most of the accents you'll hear are from Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the north of England, the south west, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the Army recruits in areas of high unemployment, and also those areas have got traditions due to the high unemployment of going into the military. Uh, so there's that economic side of it, you know, the secure job, the wages that are higher than in, uh, any job that you might get in your local area. But also there are the ideological reasons. Um, and I suppose for myself I was more of an ideological recruit than an economic recruit. When I was growing up I was fascinated with remembrance parades, I was fascinated with my grandfather's medals, um, I was fascinated with uh, commando comic books watch a lot of war movies on a Sunday afternoon. All of these things out there in our society had an effect on me that maybe didn't have the same effect on other people. When I was 13, I joined a militarised youth organisation called the Army Cadet Force, which is entirely funded by the Ministry of Defence. Um, it was through that organisation that I began to have a practical appreciation for soldiering. I actually quite liked being told what to do, uh, fulfilling tasks. I quite liked getting cold, wet, hungry. Uh, I liked the uniform. And after I've been in for a while, you get to boss the other kids around, and that's quite an attractive thing as well. Another part of the Army Cadets, uh, which is not really publicly known, but um, and was definitely the case in my time, is you're allowed, to, you're allowed to swear, you're allowed to smoke, and on the odd occasion you, you get drunk as well, which for a sort of 13 to 18 year old group of, of children is also quite attractive in comparison with other youth organisations. Um, 
I carried on in school, but um, my main focus became the army, became my only goal in life really was to become a soldier. And um, so when I eventually joined the army, I didn't need to be recruited. I didn't care how much the wages were. I didn't care how much leave you got. Um, I, w I wanted to join the army. I went into the recruiting office. I didn't need to be persuaded. I didn't need to be, you know, cajoled into it. And I joined a unit called the Parachute Regiment. Um, I'm going to move on to describing uh, the training that a soldier goes through because I think it's important that we understand how soldiers are trained and how their minds are, you could say, corrupted um, for us to understand mili modern military operations. Um, we hear a lot in the news about military ethos. If you listen to Conservative M MPs, Labour MPs, uh, they're all in agreement that this military ethos should be something, a component of us children's education. Um, that we should have cadet units in our schools, that former soldiers should teach in our schools, um, and that there should be this military ethos. And if you actually ask a politician or someone in the military, they're pretty keen on it too, what that military ethos means, it's quite hard to, to hold them down on that. It's quite hard to get them to explain what a military ethos is. And you might hear such vague things as, oh, it's about teamwork. Oh, it's about respect, or it's about discipline. But I've got my own um, sort of take on what military ethos is, and I've spoken to a lot of veterans, a lot of people who've been through military training, and we're all pretty much in agreement, um, and we've kind of simplified this, that there are three components uh, to the military ethos. And these three components are drummed into every recruit that joins the military. It doesn't matter if you join the parachute regiment or if you join the army as a cook. These uh, components are drilled into you. Obviously, depending on what unit you're in, those, that military ethos might be drilled into you a little bit harder than in some other units. I'm going to talk about my own experience. It's the experience of someone going through parachute regiment training, which is at the extreme end of military training. Um, so for us, or for me personally, the three uh, components are as follows. The first component is to follow orders without question. The second component is loyalty to the gang. And the third component is the removal of the barrier to kill. And they're the three sort of vital ingredients of making a soldier. And uh, to enable, uh, or to, yeah, to enable that training, you need to take someone from Civvy Street who has their own ambitions, their own wants and needs, and you need to change their mind somehow um, to form them into this sort of uh, this, this uh, component, not an individual anymore, a component um, that holds up that military ethos and has that military ethos ingrained into them. And one of the main ways of doing that is through fear. Uh, so you instill these, this ethos through fear. Um, if you've ever been in trouble with the police or if you've ever been in trouble, say, at school, um, you know, it would have been an individual punishment. The military works in a different way, it works on a system of group punishment. One person makes a mistake, everyone gets punished. And so um, these three components of military ethos are drummed into people um, through fear, through uh, fierce punishments, until people start to be weeded out of the process. When I joined the parachute regiment there were 35 of us in a room not much bigger than this. By the end of the training there were only 8 of us left. And those 8 people who were left did follow orders without question. Um, I often say when I go into schools, we give this lecture in schools quite a lot, um, that if you'd have told me at the end of parachute regiment training to get naked here now and run around uh, Old Street and back here, I would have done it without question. Um, the removal of the barrier to kill is another important component. Um, most human beings have a natural aversion to this. Um, there's, there have been numerous studies done in how the behaviour of soldiers in battle and it was found, for example, during the American Civil War that the majority of soldiers did not fire their weapons to kill. Archaeological digs on the battlefields of Gettysburg have found numerous rifles with multiple um, bullets loaded into those rifles. So the soldiers were going through the motions of loading their rifles but not firing them. There's also uh, much evidence, you know, written evidence from soldiers at the time that they actually aimed their rifles above the heads of, of the enemy. And that carried on into the First World War and the Second World War. And the military knew that this was a problem. Even during the Second World War, only 10 to 20% of infantry soldiers fired their weapons to kill. 
And so over the last 60 years, um, sophisticated methods of training have been used to, to get soldiers to cross that, to cross that line. Um, and some of it's done through language. So when I was in the military, I was trained to hit the centre of the mass when using a rifle. Hit the centre of a mass. Now, if you actually go through, think that through, what that actually means is shoot someone in the chest. Uh, we were told that targets will fall when hit. We were also trained rep uh, repetitively. Um, and the, the backs of our brains, the old parts of our brains, uh, which is basically the fight or flight mechanism, was manipulated again and again and again uh, to disengage the conscious part of our brain, um, and so that we could we would follow orders without question, but also kill without question. So that our first response to any perception of threat was to respond with lethal force. The um, the gang mentality, which is another important component of the military ethos, um, is is maybe one of the most disturbing elements of what was going on. Um, we were trained in the parachute regiment to hate everybody. We were trained to hate, or encouraged to hate, the Navy. We were encouraged to hate the RAF. We were encouraged to hate every other unit in the British Army that wasn't the parachute regiment. When we were in the camp, the corporals, as we uh, ran past other units, would tell them to turn away, face away, they weren't worthy to look at us. A lot of the uh, culture that we were indoctrinated with uh, backed us up with this. Uh, we were encouraged to sing um, songs about German paratroopers in the Second World War. Um, but apart from the rest of the military and the rest of the army, the people that we were taught were the lowest of the low were civilians. We had a name for them, we used to call civilians civvy cunts. The lowest of the low. The people who wouldn't even join the military. Um, fat, lazy scumbags. And um, we were indoctrinated with this ethos. Um, and part of that process made us feel pretty special. Because if you think everybody else is worthless, it makes you feel pretty special about yourself. But the other side of this I was to learn later, uh, to see it firsthand, was that if you think your own civilians are cunts, what do you think that makes foreign civilians? I'm going to move on now to um, talk about modern military operations um, as I understood them. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about a system or a process that I, is called compartmentalisation. And that means the breaking down of a process into smaller processes um, and dividing those things up so that people in one compartment don't know what's going on in the other compartment. There's two reasons for this. One is it keeps people ignorant to what they're actually doing. And two, it enables the system as a whole to carry out acts that society would think are abhorrent if they could see the whole picture. Now, this process works on many levels. Compartmentalisation comes into play um, at one of the biggest levels in terms of the people back home are informed about the conflict via the media. And those media people are embedded within the military. So the experience of the military in the field and the people back home are kept separate by the media, and a media that is embedded and not only sees one side of it. Within the military, that separation is continued again between soldiers inside the wire and soldiers outside of the wire. In, in the modern warfare, there is what is called a long tail. So for every infantry soldier, you might have nine or ten other soldiers backing that soldier up, um, cooking the bacon sandwiches, fueling up the helicopters, loading the bombs onto the planes, you get the idea. And most of these people never leave the wire. So for example, in um, Iraq, the majority of British soldiers who served in Iraq never left the main camps in Bajra at the airport or, or, or down in the city. Uh, and that's the same for the Americans as well. In um, Afghanistan, the majority of the soldiers would never have left um, the name of the camp, <coughs> evades me, but uh, the main British camp. You might see the TV programmes about them bringing that camp down. So there's, even within the army, there's this separation of experiences and separation of, of what's going on. And then within units as well, that process is carried out again. Now, um, the last place I served, I, I joined the Parachute Regiment in 1997. I served in Northern Ireland, Macedonia, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, in 2005, I was sent to Iraq to work um, 
in a special operations unit. So um, you could say that I was at the sharpest end of what was going on. And uh, our job was on the team was to detain what we called high value targets. Uh, and we were told that these people were involved in the insurgency against our occupation. Now, this job was again split down into smaller tasks. It would start off with someone gathering intelligence. Maybe they work for MI6, maybe they work for British uh, military intelligence. They'd go out there and pay for this intelligence. When you pay for intelligence, some of the intelligence you get is good, some of it not so good. In a country with high unemployment and you know not much money floating around, you should always question anyone who's being paid for intelligence. That uh, intelligence will then get handed on to our surveillance teams, another team, a separate team. They would out, go out and carry out surveillance on buildings and individuals and build up a picture of who they were and what they did. <clears throat> now what you've got to bear in mind is this team has been told by people they trust that the people they're looking at are terrorists. So everything these people do then becomes suspicious. They take their children to the school, they go shopping, they go to meet friends. It's all seen in a different light than it should be. They go digging in the garden. You know? So you start to build up a picture of who these people are and who their contacts are. And those people get added to the list too. More surveillance gets carried out. And then the job is handed on to the next team, which is the team I was involved in. And you could you know, call that team, and it's, we had different names for it, but in the news you'd call it a kill or capture team, a detention team. And uh, we would go out under curfew in the middle of the night, um, say 2 o'clock in the morning, sneak up to someone's house, place a lot of explosives on a wall or on their front door, blow our way into their house and dominate that building. Uh, we would drag everyone out of their beds, men, women and children, split them up. We'd put the men into one room, hold them at gunpoint, women and children in another, hold them at gunpoint. We then start interrogations in the house. Slap the blokes around a bit, shout at them. The women and the children we held in a separate room. Whilst we were doing that, we would go around that house and take everything out of that house of any importance into big bags. We would take passports, birth certificates, money, phones, computers, any weapons that we found in the house. And if you're thinking, oh, weapons in the house, pretty much every house in Iraq had a weapon at the time. Once we'd carried that out, we would um, take those bags, tie them up, uh, put a hood on any of the males aged between 16 and 65, cuff them, drag them out of the house, take them back to our base with all of their worldly possessions. And that would be the end of our part in, the, um, in this operation. We would then hand these people on to the next um, part of the, uh, the system. And um, it actually turned out that when we handed these people over, they were then, um, you had advanced interrogation techniques used against them uh, by our own interrogators, and then were sent to places like Abu Ghraib, Camp Nama and Camp Ballard, where they were tortured. Now you might be thinking, oh well, you know, you, you were involved in taking down these terrorists in Iraq. But um, even at the time, we knew, uh, for example, that 90% of the people that we were picking up had no involvement in the insurgency. Once we decided that a house uh, was frequented by insurgents, it didn't matter who it was we found in that building. It didn't matter if the person we were looking for wasn't there. Any males of military age were hoovered up into this system. And it actually got to the point, and I've read this since I've left, that uh, upwards of 25,000 males of military age were interned um, by the occupying forces in Iraq. Um, a good percentage tortured. Uh, there was a recent interview in The Guardian with a top ISIS commander who, um, no reason to lie about this, uh, said that 17 of the 25 top ISIS commanders had been through internment in Iraq at the hands of the occupation. So it kind of shows you how this can all play out. I'm going to kind of close up. We've got long here. Um, so that's what was going on uh, in Iraq at the time. Um, even the people running those operations didn't know the full extent of what was going on. The people back in Bajra or the, definitely didn't know what was going on. And a lot of politicians didn't even know what was going on because they were kept in the blind as to what was going on. And so at the time there was a focus on uh, detention and internment and torture. Um, but as we all know, you know, this all came into the public domain. And just, you know, in some ways um, 
those revelations were successful because the policies were changed. Um, it became embarrassing to hold prisoners. Um, you know, they've been trying to close Guantanamo for a good few years now. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the consequences of the embarrassment around holding prisoners and the logistics of holding all these prisoners is that we've now seen a move in the last five years to assassination. So once that first bit of the picture has been built up, the intelligence and the surveillance gathering, rather than a detention operation, uh, we've seen over the last five years a huge increase in assassination programmes, whether that be by special operations or drones. Uh, I'm aware of the time, so just to sort of finish off there, you know, um, the events I'm talking about, my own experiences, you're talking about 10 years ago, and what's happened since then? Well, what's happened since then is this whole programme has been expanded. What was once fairly specialised, carried out by very small units, has been expanded across the world. The American Special Forces operate in 133 countries. Uh, drones operate all around the world. In Britain, um, we've had a long-term trend from where special operations was a very small uh, contained unit uh, to actually seeing that if you ask questions about special operations in the Houses of Parliament, um, you were told that politicians don't answer questions about special operations. And as a result of that, a huge umbrella has grown and lots of units that were never in special operations have been stuffed into that umbrella because you've got the deniability of operations once they're stuffed under that. Uh, so I'm going to finish there. I hope I've given you some sort of insight. I usually, like I say, I've tried to condense a lot there into 20 minutes. Um, but, you know, you're welcome to ask questions at the end after the other speakers have spoken. And if you want to speak personally, you can always come up to me afterwards. Uh, so thanks a lot.